good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> My name is James Cadogan. I am a VP of Criminal Justice at Arnold Ventures, overseeing our pretrial team, where we make investments in bail reform, prosecution, courts, public defense, anything that touches a courtroom we are interested. And I'm extraordinarily pleased to be joined by these four distinguished gentlemen today to talk through where we are in pretrial justice in the United States right now. So I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves with a little bit more specificity, but I will run through titles so you know where everybody comes from. I know a lot of folks know each other in the room, but so we're clear we have a diversity of expertise here, both in terms of discipline and in terms of regional expertise from geography. So I am extraordinarily excited to get this conversation going to hear if we can do some comparative analysis and learn from each of these folks how they're seeing pretrial justice and bail reform shape up in their own jurisdictions and how that relates to the broader national narrative and reform impetus. So first to my left, we have Alec Kirikatsanis, who is the founder and executive director of Civil Rights Corps and litigator extraordinaire. So very much looking forward to hearing some insights on litigation from you, Alec. Next to him, we have Marvin Mayfield, who is the New York State Organizer for Just Leadership USA, who has deep insights into what's going on in New York right now. Then Daniel Dew, the legal fellow at the Buckeye Institute's Legal Center in Ohio. And finally, Mike Bouchard, Chief of Pretrial Services in the First Judicial District of Pennsylvania, which is Philadelphia. And so we know a lot of folks are looking at Philadelphia right now for a lot of different reasons, but having Mike here is a really great practitioner insight. So to uh, kick things off, I'm going to not go down the usual path of diagnosing the problem because this is smart on crime, so pretty much everybody here understands the fundamental challenges of our pretrial justice system and bail reform. And instead, I'm gonna dive in by asking each of our panelists to talk a little bit about why they got into this particular line of work and use that as our springboard into the conversation. So, Alec, you're up first. So I started my career as a public defender in Alabama, and the things that I saw uh, as a public defender, I think, set the course for the rest of my career. Um, the thing that struck me the most um, when I began practicing in, in federal court in Alabama was just how normalized a lot of the everyday brutality of the criminal punishment bureaucracy was. We were utterly desensitized to the pain that we were inflicting, all of us. Um, the public defenders, the prosecutors, the judges, the probation officers, pretrial services officers. Um, we were part of this machine that was processing human beings into cages. And, um, you know, we would, we would have these, these incredible sentencing hearings in federal court. And I remember um, trying to just get the judges to understand, um, you know, what was at stake at these hearings. We would, we would ask very simple things like, Your Honor, can you um, order the U.S. Marshals to um, unshackle my client so that she can hug her children before she's deported. Um, and we would, we would try to create little moments like that, um, little moments where the courts could maybe understand just for a brief second um, the incredible pain and, and misery that our society is inflicting, and I think all too often without asking itself what, for what reason. Um, and that led me to want to explore in some broader way how we could change the underlying narratives that um, led to this situation where we're all every single day normalized to the injustice that we're causing. And so started working on bigger picture, more systemic cases that could um, work with clients and, and directly impacted people in their communities to um, tell a different story about our criminal punishment bureaucracy. Um, one about the, the pain and misery that it's inflicting and one about the power and hope that can come from changing that narrative and organizing power around a different um, set of assumptions about, about what is community safety and well-being and holistic community flourishing. And so that's how I came actually to, to systemic litigation. I actually don't like being a lawyer and don't particularly like litigating in court. I don't think it's a particularly useful method of solving problems, nor do I trust our court system, which has for several hundred years been about white supremacy and capitalism uh, to solve any of these big problems. But I'm a systemic litigator because I think it's a different way of telling stories. And it offers a forum that people listen to um, to tell stories that have been ignored for a long time. So I think that's, that's how I came to, to what I'm doing now. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Marvin, you wanna tell us about your work? Uh, thank you, James. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't think I could tell you 
um, how I came into this work without telling you about, about myself, about who I am and where I came from. I am a native New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, um, in a park called bed which has been uh, gentrified recently. It doesn't look like the, the uh, bed that I grew up in back in the 70s. Um, best I was a slum back then. It was a slum, and everything uh, that is associated with a slum, everything you can imagine, uh, was part of that community. Poverty, crime, um, uh, domestic violence, um, drug abuse. All those things became part of my life. All the things that shaped who I am and who I became. Um, I've been directly involved in the criminal justice system, formerly incarcerated as well, so um, the issue of criminal justice reform is something that is very, very personal to me. Um, just a little brief story is that I was 22 years old, and um, I was just learning how to take care of myself. I'm walking down the street in Bedford Cyrus in one day and I was arrested on suspicion of burglary. First time I've ever been arrested. And um, back in that time, the, the uh, police would call us something called tune you up. And when they mean tune you up, they mean, you know, beat your ass for a while until they get tired. So, and this is what happened. So, you know, I got uh, abused by the police and um, I got arrested, um, taken to uh, Rikers Island where I stayed for like, uh, Maybe it was nine months, uh, unable to make bail, um, not giving any evidence of any uh, uh, charges against me. There was no, I mean, the discovery portion of it was just ignored. Um, so I'm sitting there for nine months, no speedy trial. So when I um, uh, got out of prison, I made a determination that I was going to be a voice for those who were still there, those who were still voices. And uh, in, in short, I wanted some payback. You know, I wanted some payback to a system that I felt was corrupt, that was biased toward, toward black people, mm -hmm. and uh, especially in my community. It, um, going to jail and prison became almost a rite of passage. It was expected, it was not, it, uh, deterred in any way by, uh, by our schools or anything else. Everybody expected if you came from this neighborhood, at some point in time, you're going to end up in jail. Um, I want to change that. I want to change that narrative. I want to change that uh, perception that black people in inner cities, even no matter what your uh, economical status is, is that we are not inherently bad and are going to end up in prison. There were certain factors that contributed to our condition. And I got into this work because I believe passionately that we can and will do better as a people when we are better informed and when we, as those who are directly impacted, uh, stand up and say, I'm not gonna take it anymore and I'm gonna get involved. And that's how I got involved. Thank you. So my name is Daniel Dew. I work at the Buckeye Institute. We are a free market think tank um, in Columbus, Ohio. We lurk, work primarily in Ohio, but, but are looking to uh, expand our successes into other states. And so the reason that I got involved in this work at the very beginning, I have uh, justice-involved family members, so it's a, it's a really uh, personal issue to me. Um, but from, a, from the standpoint of our organization, when you think of a, a free market think tank, you think of taxes, regulations, but our goal is to remove barriers to human flourishing. We want people to be successful. What is a bigger burden than people wasting away in a jail cell or in a prison cell? Um, you know, that is a, that is a huge barrier to, to them, their families, and so, we want to make sure that we are effectively using our resources, that we are, we are making sure that people are, are better off because of our, our system, not worse off, which I think is, is um, all far too often the case. We, we got involved in bail reform specifically um, because we were looking for what, it, what is something that we can do immediately that will have a big impact 
on on people as as uh, as we're doing these reforms statewide, and we have this population of people that haven't even been convicted of a crime, and yet they make up 57 percent of our jails in Ohio. That's just incredible to me, and I'll, I can talk about this a little bit later. Uh, you know how how we're attacking that in Ohio, but you know just the presumption of innocence and the liberty that's lost is is incredible because of our unjust pretrial justice system. Thanks. My name is Mike Bouchard. I'm the director of pretrial services for Philadelphia and kind of have a unique way that I came into this role. So I started out my career in probation, juvenile probation. And when I started working there, I had all these ideas of how much I could help. And you get into that role and I found it extraordinarily mechanical and heavy caseloads, and was I really making a difference in these children and families' lives? And I thought, no, you know, I need to look at getting into the front end of the system. So, uh, and uh, I learned a lot there, left and became a police officer, later a detective. And I thought that that was going to be my calling and I could make a difference. And I think in individual ways I did, but it still wasn't big enough to really affect and be involved at the level that I think um, I could have been to help. So I dabbled a little bit in uh, academia and eventually made my way uh, to Philadelphia where uh, pretrial services five years ago, six years ago in Philadelphia um, was nowhere near what it should be. It had a very heavy law enforcement aspect to it. Um, we pulled away from that and we've really jumped headfirst into the bail reform movement and really looking at this, as some have touched on, in a much more humanizing way and really diving into the needs um, of people at the front end of the system. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and the reason I started with, it, with that particular question is because I think too often in these conversations we don't actually look at practitioners as parts of our community and think about how they are coming to uh, criminal justice reform and in pretrial justice we have such a wonderful conversation right now nationally and it's incredibly important that we all understand that the folks who sit in the chairs that each of these gentlemen sit in have their own stories that connect to exactly why we're working on pretrial justice throughout the nation. So the big thing that I take from everything that each of you just said is a sense of urgency about the mission of reforming the pretrial justice system. What I'd like to do now is to jump into some of the differences and some of the challenges that you see in each of your localities, and I'm gonna start with you, Daniel, in thinking about Ohio and narrative. Because one of the things that I think we've seen is a very clear narrative at a national level about pretrial justice with varying perspectives on it, but a clear narrative. And then there's a different narrative that exists on the ground, oftentimes amongst practitioners, that that gap is something that I think we don't often enough address and would love to hear how you are thinking about that because I know you've done a lot of writing on pretrial justice and how you, the Buckeye Institute is approaching that kind of shift. Yeah, so we... Um so, uh, like I said, we were trying to look for different ways that we could have a big impact on the criminal justice system. And looking at, like I said, 57% of our jail is our people there not serving a sentence. Um, Cleveland.com, which is the digital arm of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, did a great series called Justice for All, where they're looking at these people who are held in jail for things that are just ridiculous, you know, people who can't afford bail because they were drunken jaywalking, disorderly conduct, sitting in jail for these inordinate amount of time. And we thought, this is a great opportunity to let's get some movement at the state level on getting some real reform. And unfortunately, that message didn't resonate with a whole lot of people. Um, I know you're not supposed to read the comments, but I went through and I read the comments. And the overwhelming majority of the comments were, well, if they didn't break the law, they wouldn't have to worry about it. That's, that's the response. And those are the people that are, the people that are commenting are the people that are calling their legislators. So how do we combat that narrative? 
and we saw that New Mexico had done some bail reform, New Jersey, and people are trying to turn this into a public safety issue. And so what we did is we tried to really change the narrative because not only is it a fundamental fairness issue, but it really is a public safety issue. So we had in um, the same time frame in Ohio, there was a young man in Dayton who uh, was probably mouthing off to a bus driver or something, and it just so happened he wasn't complying with the RTA dress code, so they got him for trespassing on public transportation. He sat in jail for nine days until his mother could get a car title loan to, to bail him out of jail. At that same time in Pennsylvania, uh, there was a, a young man about the same age who was accused of murdering people and his family was able to put together the resources. He posted a million dollar bail and walked out and was later picked up committing another felony and, and admitted to burying the people on his family farm. And so we see people treated so differently based off of the resources that they have. So what we did is we tried to put both narratives together. Not only is it unfair for people who are, we're not really scared of, they're not dangerous or, or anything, and they're merely accused of committing this crime, right? They didn't, they haven't been convicted of it. We can't be holding them accountable for something they haven't been convicted of. But then on the other end, we have people who truly are dangerous, truly are threats, who can afford a large amount of cash bail and can walk out. We, so we put together a, a big group of, of stories on both sides, looking at, at people who, who couldn't get out because they were too poor and people who walked away to, you know, unfortunately kill their, their original victims or kill other people um, because they could afford their cash bail. And that's just, when people see that dichotomy, I think it really resonates, but they need to, needed to see both sides of it. And because of that, we have legislators who are talking about it. Our, our Supreme Court uh, put, the, put out recommendations on how we can move towards rec uh, bail reform. And you know that's only gonna get us part of the way there. We're gonna need legislation to, to get us to tri true uh, pretrial detention reform. But I think that changing that narrative really helped us to start the conversation with people who otherwise wouldn't be listening to us or, or caring about what we're saying. And could you give uh, the audience here a sense of where Ohio is right now? You mentioned the reports from uh, your judiciary. Uh, but situate the progress that you see and against some of the challenges that, that, you know, that we know you may be facing right now. Sure. So we have a report come out from a task force. Um, I was lucky enough to sit on it. It did not go as far as we would have liked, um, but it, I think it changes our, they suggested cr changing our criminal rule 46 in a way that's a positive. So at least it says, you know, let's look at the least restrictive means of ensuring public safety and, and of returning people to court. It changes the definition of bail to include things other than money. And it says that you know people shouldn't be held in, in jail just because they can't afford it. So that's that's great, um, but you know we're going to have to go go further than that. Uh, if anybody wants to submit comments, those that rule is up for comment until November first. Contact me. I'll I'll uh, let you know where to submit those because we're looking for all the the help that we can get to make sure that we get a strong rule. But then we're also going to need some legislation. To, to take us the rest of the way there. So that is a perfect segue into the New York part of the conversation. And Marvin, it'd be great if you could give us some insight into the reforms that just got passed and signed into law in New York. I know you were instrumental in the, the work leading up to that. Uh, set the scene for us and tell us where New York was, how you got to the point of legislation, how, and then where you think we're gonna be in terms of implementation come 2020. Um, historically, New York State, uh, in particular New York City, um, had some really uh, draconian practices. Um, as far as, as back as I can remember, uh, in dealing with the criminal justice system and the courts in New York City, New York State, um, there was a tremendous disparity 
between who is held in jails and who is not. And one of the simplest ways that a person could see this uh, immediately was by color, by skin color. Most, um, or in most cases, uh, when a person goes to court, they're arraigned, they go to the court, and if a bail is set, they, um, if they can make their bail, if they can make their bail, they get, get released. Um, they can get released a um, day or two, whatever, but if you can't make that bail, you, you become part of the, uh, the commodity, I would say, in, in, uh, in this thing called a prison industrial complex. And um, from what I have seen, and what statistics will support, is that there's mainly black and brown people who become uh, incarcerated because they can't afford a bail. I fell into that category, so I know it firsthand. Um, also, along with that were the uh, outdated rules and, uh, against uh, supporting discovery in New York State, where um, prosecutors would not release information or, or uh, evidence to the, to the defense so that the uh, defendant could not present themselves or prepare themselves a, a, a proper defense. And this went on and on for ages and ages, and it, it, it became uh, a mechanism for um, uh, district attorneys, prosecutors to receive um, plea bargains. And 97% in New York City, 97% of all cases in New York City were, um, were uh, uh, adjudicated through a plea bargain. So this was uh, used as to coerce people into taking these pleas because of the conditions that they had to suffer so long. You couldn't get out of jail, you didn't have the bail, you're suffering on Rikers Island, and you don't know what the charges are against you. And, and, and uh, after that, so let's say you're going to court back and forth for seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 months, and you're going through this process over and over, day after day, week after week, and suffering what, what people would call bullpen therapy, where they chain you in the morning at five in the, mor in the morning, and you walk that way throughout, throughout the day, back and forth to uh, holding cells, sometimes to see nobody, and over and over, month after month. After that, and uh, the uh, prosecutor would say, okay, well, if you plead guilty today, if you plead guilty today, we'll release you. How many people would have the fortitude to say, you know what, I don't want to leave now? This was the case with Khalif Browder. This was the case with him. He stood and, and demanded that his rights to a fair trial be recognized. And he paid for it. He paid for it with um, some severe beating, severe trauma that cost him his life. In New York State, we have, through the... Um, tireless efforts of advocates, through the tireless efforts of supporters, through the tireless efforts of people who have been directly impacted, who have been incarcerated justly and unjustly. Through, those, through that work, we have um, gained some historic legislation in New York State where we have just eliminated the uh, monetar monetary bail for all misdemeanor charges, for some uh, a statutory felony, char um, violent charges, right? Yeah, clap it up. <laughs> that's, that's historic, historic. And for um, uh, all nonviolent charges. So in addition to that, uh, discovery was part of the bill that was just passed in New York State where prosecutors can no longer uh, uh, hold all the cards and practice blindfold prosecution. Uh, discovery must be implemented within 15 days of a person being, being uh, detained. That's historic. That's historic for what we're going through. And we also made some uh, progress in the speedy trial. Um, not as much as we would like, but we're still going back, and f back for more um, uh, legislation on that. So this is where we are today. Um, these uh, new laws take effect uh, January 1st. But, and hear this, <laughs> I'm somewhat of a skeptic. Um, even though we have gained this uh, monumental legislation, as of yet, it has not decarcerated our jails. Um, 
let me give you a little bit of history lesson. In 1864, the Emancipation Proclamation was passed. In 1869, <laughs> the uh, troops uh, from the northern troops had to come in and liberate slaves that were still on the plantations because implementation had not taken place. This is what we're facing right now in, in New York State. We're focusing on implementing these new laws and make sure that we're not um, going to get a lot of pushback or and not gain, I mean, lose any of the gains that we've made. So that's where we are today, and the, the, uh, the issue today is implementation Implementation, implementation. That's a, uh, another perfect segue because I'd like to go to you, Mike, to talk about the practitioner side. You're the chief of pretrial services in Philadelphia. But tell us about implementation and what it's actually like to exist in this environment where bail reform is the watchword of a lot of criminal justice activity and you are responsible for implementing those kinds of changes and thinking about how you can be forward leaning within the constraints of your responsibility and the law and make sure that you are actually discharging your duties while against the backdrop being against the backdrop of serious political dialogue on exactly your area of responsibility. Yes, so it's been quite a challenge. We have been involved in the safety and justice challenge which is supported by the MacArthur Foundation and coming into that we were facing to the left of the screen, which it doesn't go back as far as I thought it did, but we were looking at a pop prison population of 8,082 people, and the discussion was building a new jail. And that was five or six years ago, that's where Philadelphia was looking. And today, we've reduced the prison population 40%, most of those pre-trial, which I'll get to in a second, and closed a prison. We closed the House of Corrections, um, earlier than the mayor's time frame, which was in 2020, and it closed, I believe, about a year ago, year and a half ago. So doing those, with, we have no legislative intervention, no judicial intervention. It was on the ground work of all of our justice partners and the community, um, which I will talk about a, a little bit as well. And fighting those fights, at the beginning of this challenge, we all sat down in a room and um, I was telling James earlier, the conversations were extraordinarily spirited. And what we all had was a passion for where we wanted to go. We all had the same goals. One of those big overarching goals was um, eliminate cash bail, reduce racial and ethnic disparities in our jails um, and system wide. So as we pushed through that, um, we kept coming back to the table. Everybody, all of the leaders, kept coming back as much as we may have disagreed and, let's be real, screamed at each other and had just an immense amount of passion and walking out of those rooms, we kept doing it, which is what got us to where we are. Now, don't get me wrong, we have a lot more work to do. Our goal is to have an overall 50% reduction by the end of next year. So we'll look at that. I wanted to focus on one of the challenges we had was actually, and this might be hard to see, but was actually identifying who was in our prison and how the different justice partners identified those people. So when you're really sitting on the ground and you're talking to the prison commissioner about pretrial and stats going out, they're looking at pretrial differently than maybe the courts are looking at it. So we took data and really broke down confinement categories in the prison. And if you look at the second column, that is the pretrial, non-murder, no detainers. Let me tell you how much work this was to get to agreements on what the different confinement categories should be. So that focus there, the 86% of that group were held on cash bail. So when we were looking at initiatives to focus on the different categories, we really focused on, okay, what can we do in this confinement category to really drop down? That was the leading driver of our jail population four years ago. Today it is not. So the work that was done was extraordinarily impressive. Um, here's a little snapshot, and I think something that must be said that was touched on in earlier sessions is we dropped our prison population 40%. So there's uh, thousands of people no longer in jail. Look at our racial and ethnic disparity. It didn't change. So on the one hand, our initiatives did not exacerbate the problem, but we didn't fix it. We have a lot more work to do, and we have renewed our efforts 
um, and doubled down on really focusing on that area. Um, the bottom left part of the graph kind of breaks down the pretrial population, what I was discussing earlier, um, if that interests you. So one program that really focused on this group that I think I'm always interested when I go to conferences to hear on the ground work and specific initiatives that are happening, so I wanted to try and give a quick synopsis of one of our programs. It's through our munici municipal court, and it's called our Early Bail Review Program. So unfortunately, we still have cash bail in Philadelphia. But what we're doing is anyone who is issued $100,000 or less in cash bail um, receives, and there are certain charge exclusions to this, but receives an early bail review hearing within five days of their initial bail setting. So they go in front of our magistrates, um, initially set the uh, bail, and five days later they're in front of a judge. And it has had wild success. 86% of those who receive a hearing are being released in some form, either ROR, SOB, or to pretrial services. And it has, uh, it's affected thousands of people and that is a huge driver of the population. So there were some skeptics. If you pay attention to Philadelphia, you know that our um, murder rate and shooting rate is increasing. So we wanted to, we wanted to see if, one, if this specific initiative was affecting that. Um, and this is, these are some results, they're hard to read, but the long story shor short is people who were released on our early bail review hearings were not the people committing the violent crimes out in the community. So there was no linkage to that, and I think that was part of, uh, the police were very interested if there was a connection there. And the police actually did this research and found, came back to us and said, yeah, that's not happening. So uh, I think that things like this, that even though we're not being forced into a situation, New Jersey legislated, New York legislated, judicial decisions, you can do it at home. If you have the right people and the passion and you, the willingness to keep coming together, it can be done, and we're gonna continue to work and hopefully uh, meet our next goal, and then we'll set another goal, and it goes back to those. This morning, they are talking about the incremental steps, and I think that our incremental steps are leading to major transformation, um, and I, I can't wait to see where we're at in five years. I think we have a new tagline, pre-trial justice, you can do it at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we don't have the kind of narrative work that Daniel talked about, the legislative momentum that Marvin talked about, or creative professionals who are committed to doing what they can in lieu of legislation, as you just talked about, Mike, then it seems like we have one other thing that we have yet to talk about that's incredibly important here, and that's litigation. So Alec, tell us a little bit about Texas, about litigation, Civil Rights Corps approach, and where you are in Harris County right now, because I think that's a great object lesson for how you can actually begin to bring about some of the changes that each of our other panelists has talked about. When we went to Harris County first in early 2016, um, there were 132 suicide attempts in the Harris County Jail that year. Um, 55 human beings had died in the Harris County Jail because they couldn't pay money bail in the six years before our lawsuit. So the situation was um, as it is in every single one of our 3,000 cages around the country, an urgent situation. Um, when we got there, um, we saw what we saw in every other place that we were filing lawsuits. We saw um, bail hearings, I'll, I'll put that term in air quotes, at which um, a person was told not to speak and was given um, a, a choice, um, pay this amount of money um, or stay in a cage. Of course, it's, the choice is, is illusory for anyone who is poor. And um, these hearings lasted um, five or six seconds in terms of the bail part and, and the rest of the total hearing where they read the charges, you know, 30 seconds or a minute. And we watched thousands of these hearings. Um, and we ended up filing a major class action lawsuit against Harris County and the sheriff and, and, and all of the judges. One of the things that struck me the most um, when I started doing the bail litigation uh, around the country in Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and, and Georgia and Oklahoma, Texas, California, Chicago, um, Massachusetts, every single place, th there's this extraordinary gap between the way the law is written and the way the law is lived and experienced 
um, and execute it onto people's bodies, particularly people who don't have any power. So you have these lofty constitutional scrolls with, with beautiful phrasing. Um, the, courtroom, the courthouse in New Orleans says something in marble on top of it about it, how the importance of impartial justice. And you know that we just want a case striking down the New Orleans money bail system because the judges in New Orleans all take a percentage cut of the money whenever they set a money bail. So you have the, this stark contrast between the impartiality on the marble facade and, and the, the financial interest that judges have in um, setting money bail for people in their cases. So when we got to Houston, we saw that gap. You know, this is a place in, I don't know, has anyone been to downtown Houston before? Um, the jail building is actually quite, quite aesthetically beautiful. It, it overlooks the bayou and the water. Um, all these windows, um, the windows are fake. Um, the windows are for the people who live in downtown Houston who can see the jail and they want to look at a nice building. But the people inside aren't getting sunlight. They're not getting fresh air. They're not getting all of the things that we take for granted in life, like the ability to hug our child. Um, they also use a for-profit video calling system instead of in-person visits in a lot of jails around the country, including in Harris County. Um, it's a multi-billion dollar a year industry around monetizing human contact with people's family. These are the things that we confronted that weren't part of the bail litigation, and they weren't part of our claims, but they were what the community was telling us the bail case was about. Um, and I think that's a really important point because um, when you make the bail case about child and family separation and sexual assault and stabbings inside the jail and the lack of fresh air and sunlight, the inability to hug your family, the inability to go to your job. It changes the way we all think about what kinds of justifications we have to have if we're gonna subject someone to that. So at the core, you know, there's a lot of fancy legal work being done right in court. You, you, you can't just say this is unfair, you have to go to court and you have to pretend like there's you know, different cases that your case is like and you have to do all this sort of complicated reasoning. But the core of our cases is saying um, the government shouldn't put somebody in a cage without an extraordinarily good reason. And um, it turns out that's what the Constitution says too. And it's this gap again between what the Constitution says and what we do in 3,000 local jurisdictions all over the country. So we brought this case uh, in Harris County, Texas. We, we um, really for the first time that I'm aware of um, put the American money bail system on trial. We had an eight-day evidentiary hearing. We played thousands of videos. We studied hundreds of thousands of cases. Um, there were expert witnesses called from both sides. Um, the sheriff testified, DAs testified, public defenders submitted evidence. Um, Jacob Sills here in the front row submitted some evidence for us. Um, Charisse also, um, Pre-Trial Justice Institute. Basically, anybody doing this work around the country um, submitted evidence because this was the time when we were gonna actually put this, this system on trial. It was a fascinating um, situation. So when, we, when we got there, um, Harris County arrested about 50,000 people every single year for misdemeanor offenses alone. Um, about 20,000 of those people were detained for the entire duration of their case. They were detained because they couldn't afford to pay about $100 or $200, depending on what the, the market rate was for a bail bond in, in downtown Houston. Um, and according to the bail schedule that the misdemeanor judges used. Um, if you were able to afford to get out of jail prior to trial, so about 60% of people, 30,000 people, who paid, a mon most of them paying um, to a for-profit bail bond company um, some amount of money to get out of jail, those people were 51% likely to never get convicted of anything. Their cases lasted 120 days on average while they investigated the case and they had a lawyer fighting it, and most of them prevailed. For the 20,000 people who were detained because they couldn't afford to pay a couple hundred dollars, 84% of them pled guilty. And 84% of them pled guilty in a median of 3.2 days. So this system wasn't about inquiring into whether the person was guilty of the offense or not, or doing any kind of rigorous analysis of the facts or of justice. It was a processing system for bodies. It was a way for Harris County to get as many convictions as possible because no society in the recorded history of the modern world has ever tried to arrest and process and cage 
this percentage of its population. It's simply impossible to give every case the attention that it deserves if you arrest this many millions of people. And that's what we saw Harris County doing. And so uh, the judge in Harris County issued a landmark ruling eviscerating any factual basis for the modern American money bail system, any legal basis for it. Um, and uh, a lot of other things happened, um, including um, some amazing community work by the Texas Organizing Project and others. They took those bail videos that we were given in our case and they turned them into campaign material. They turned them into public education sessions and YouTube videos. And um, over the course of our litigation, every single public official in Harris County who ran on the platform of bail reform, and that was in every single election because it became such a popular issue in the campaign, everyone had an opinion about it. Everyone who supported our lawsuit in the bail reform movement won and defeated the incumbents. First in 2016, it was a judge, a sheriff, and the DA. Now in, in 2018 election, all 15 of the other judges who had been arguing throughout our case that nobody's in the Harris County jail because they're poor, they're in the Harris County jail because they want to be there. That was their main argument at trial. Um, they spent, I think, about $100,000 on an expert witness purporting to testify that people were not in the jail because they were poor. Um, <laughs> it was bizarre stuff. Um, but those people were all voted out of office. And um, on their first day in office, um, they said to us, we want to work out a new bail system in Harris County um, for misdemeanors. Um, oh, I don't have time to get to felonies. Um, but we're working on that too. Um, and there's a few important features of the new Harris County money bail system for misdemeanors that I think are interesting to highlight. One, um, in a similar way to what Marvin was mentioning in New York, um, it makes categorical exclusions. So for the vast majority of cases, you are not permitted to set a monetary bond. Um, you are not permitted to detain the person. The person must get out of jail immediately. And that was really important to us. Um, you know, PGI has done a lot of great work over the years with the Three Days Count campaign and also highlighting, um, for example, that um, if you're in jail for just 24, 48 hours, it has an incredible effect on your life. You could lose your job, you could lose your shelter. You don't know where your kids are. I mean, how many of my clients have actually not known where their little babies are while they're in jail? Um, you can, you can um, miss a dose of very important medication, right? So it's important to get people out of jail as soon as possible. That to me is one of the things that's most troubling about this Philadelphia program that we just heard about, where it's a wildly successful program. We're hearing that 86% of these people are getting out of jail, but we're not even having the hearing until five days after their initial bail hearing. Imagine the damage that would be done to your life in those five days. We need to get to the point where every hour, every minute counts, and then we need to get to the point where we're not putting people into these systems in general. So that was one important piece of our Harris County settlement was immediately on arrest, as soon as all the information is, is put into the system, you get out of jail um, on, a, on an unsecured um, personal release bond. A second big um, part of it was um, we put into place very rigorous procedural and substantive protections for cases that the judges were concerned about. These are cases that the judges felt they needed some personal attention to, people that they wanted to, to see for a bail hearing. They couldn't be released immediately. And we put into place um, very rigorous protections, um, a right to counsel at a bail hearing, because when we sued them, there was no lawyer, um, a right to uh, confront evidence against you, a right to put on evidence, to see the evidence that the DA had, um, a right to put on your own witnesses, to put on your own release plan, um, and then if the judge wanted to detain you or to set a money bond that you couldn't afford, the judge had to find by clear and convincing evidence that there was absolutely no other possible way that they could protect against a very particular articulable interest, which we think is as far as we could go because that's really what the Constitution requires. The next part of the settlement agreement, when I think maybe one of the aspects that's the most groundbreaking, is it requires Harris County to make a number of investments in alternative ways of thinking about um, pretrial community well-being. Um, so it requires Harris County to study and then spend millions of dollars on things like um, text message reminders, people come back to court, transportation to court, maybe childcare services, housing and drug addiction treatment, things like that. Harris County has to actually look into all of these other things and see, um, is there a way that these things could help us reduce the need for pretrial incarceration? It also has to provide um, adequate public defenders and not only public defender lawyers, but investigators and social workers so that public defenders can help people access services in the community. And there's a lot of other components to it, um, and I, I've already gone on 
um, too long. Um, but this is um, the kind of thing that's possible, not through just a lawsuit, um, because many of our other lawsuits aren't having that kind of success. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, hopefully, I don't think it's possible to have success through the courts. These are the kind of things that were possible because of the community organizing that was done in Harris County that changed the, the, the way everybody thought about what was happening. Um, and, and I think the last thing I'll say is um, Rodney Ellis, one of the, the local commissioners who really led a lot of this, this fight, um, called the, the settlement something like, you know, it was like, he compared it to Brown versus Board of Education. And I, I called him and I said, you know, Rodney, like, um, I don't know about Brown, you know, 60 years after Brown versus Board of Education, um, we have more segregation in schools in, in much of the country. Um, what is thought of as the greatest civil rights victory in, in American court history is really a story of, the, of, the, of the, the fact that courts are agents of social stability and not mechanisms of radical social change. Um, if you look at the same-sex marriage cases, they, a bunch of smart lawyers brought a case 30, 40 years ago, all over the country, the same case, same 14th Amendment, they lost. 30, 40 years later, other lawyers, not any smarter, brought the same cases under the same few words in the 14th Amendment, and they won. What was the difference? It wasn't that courts became better, that courts became a viable strategy for social change. It was a movement that changed the way we think about same-sex marriage. What happened in Harris County was a local movement that changed the way everybody thinks about whether we need justification to put human beings in cages. And that's the kind of thing we need nationally um, as, a, as a movement, as a community, and it's only gonna be done, in my opinion, um, by what Marvin said, which is listening to the voices of the people who are directly impacted because they're the people that can tell the story with the right amount of, of urgency and, and care. Thank you all. Um, we're gonna do about 50 more minutes of questions, only this time I'm just gonna throw questions out to whomever wants to pick them up and answer, and if nobody wants to pick it up and answer, then I'm gonna call on people. Uh, after that, we'll have about half an hour for questions from the audience. Uh, so, uh, oh, actually, let me uh, pass these. Yeah. Oh. So first, Alec, I think what you said leads into uh, a really important framing for all of us, which is 2020. And I don't mean that in terms of the presidential election coming up, I mean that in terms of real momentum that we see at different stages in each of your jurisdictions. But there's a national bail reform conversation that impacts all of that local work. So I'd love to hear from any or all of you what you think is most important for 2020 when it comes to pretrial justice where and what should we be looking at in terms of the reform movement? I see you making eyes, Marvin. <laughs> well, I didn't want to be the first one to jump at it. <clears throat> um, I think as I alluded to before is that um, even with the um, historic and landmark changes in, in, in um, uh, that we have uh, gained, um, it has yet to decarcerate the jails. Um, and I'm just gonna use New York City as an example and, and, and the plight of Rikers Island. Uh, Rikers Island is, uh, by sheer virtue of its size, um, is one of the major contributors to uh, mass incarceration. Um, at the height of uh, uh, Rikers Island's um, capacity, um, it, there were 22,000 unlucky men and women, 22,000 souls kept on Rikers Island. Um, through efforts that we've been uh, working on um, in this new legislation, um, the numbers have been going down and down and down over the years due to a better uh, understanding of addiction and alternative to incarceration and things like that. So the numbers have been going down. And in New York City, uh, the numbers are, have been gone, gone down drastically to the point where now we're at about 7,000, maybe 7,500 um, uh, people being incarcerated at any given moment in New York City. Uh, with this new legislation coming in in 2020, 
we anticipate that that level will go down by half, by half. I mean, and um, the, the city is preparing for, uh, to uh, reduce the, the capacity to incarcerate people in the city um, to a level of like 4,000. We believe that with, with uh, even um, greater uh, focus on mental health treatment and things like that, uh, and um, alternatives to incarceration, we can bring that down to about 3,000. So in 2020, we're, we're looking to uh, decrease the um, pretrial detention population by half. And that's not just in New York City, that is statewide. Statewide, because at any given time, uh, b b prior to this legislation, there were 74,000 people being held in um, New York City, New York, I mean, New York State um, jails at any given time, and 78% uh, of those were pre trial. Pre trial. I mean, just think about it. The, the, uh, uh, the difference is going to make on our communities. And we know that when, when a person goes to jail, who goes to prison, they don't go alone. They, it's their families who suffer, their children who suffer. The community suffers by in, in ways that you can't even uh, um, imagine. Uh, a, a man or a woman is taken from their community, that community loses a wage, wake, a, a wage maker. I mean, in uh, many different ways, uh, children end up in foster care and all kinds of things because of these things. Uh, um, 2020, we want to see this whole, um, this whole system turned on its head, turned over where uh, fairness is now uh, a part of, uh, of the, this, the court system. I mean, just simple fairness. And, I don't think anybody, anybody, including myself, being an activist and, and, a, and at heart an abolitionist, um, is not concerned about public safety. We all are. But I think that the thing that we really need to be concerned about is public fairness. For far too long, um, black and brown people in our community have taken the brunt of this criminal justice system. And I think it's time that fairness does play a part in our courts. Fantastic, and that notion of public fairness, I think is truly wonderful. Dan Daniel, I wanna get you in on this question of what are you looking at in 2020 and where are you focused right now? Yeah, I think, I think culturally, I think that, that that's important. And I think that it's important that we don't look at fairness and public safety as mutually exclusive, right? Those two things, can work together. I talked about the, pers the, the young man in Pennsylvania uh, who uh, unfortunately murdered somebody and the young man who was trespassing on public transportation. You can probably guess which race each of those people were. I mean, it's, it's not good. But looking to 2020, I really hope that uh, in Ohio, I hope we get some, some good criminal, uh, uh, a good criminal rule. Um, the process is that if, it's, uh, if the Supreme Court approves it, it'll go into effect on July 1 of next year, and we hope that we have legislation that requires that a person um, be found, if the court find by clear and convincing evidence that the person um, not only committed the offense, but poses an articulable risk to the community in order to be held, and otherwise you know, they enjoy uh, their liberty pre-trial. So I hope that, that that's where we go, um, not only in Ohio, but in, in other places that we really meld the two concepts of fairness and safety and realize that no matter what aspect of criminal justice reform that you're looking at, you can achieve both. And I think that that's why you have this unique moment where people on the right and the left are coming together because whether you're looking at it from safety, fairness, money, you know, we're all kind of looking at the same solutions because it just so happens that, that there are solutions that can achieve all three. Thank you. Mike, you wanted to comment? Sure, so to your where, um, I think everywhere. I was just reading the PJI's What's Happening in Pretrial Justice, and I had a hard time finding a state that isn't moving forward and going to have some sort of uh, 
something going on in bail reform in 2020. Um, as far as Philadelphia, I think we are beginning to uh, attempt to correct some missteps that we've made over the past four years. We've had success, um, but at the same time, um, one major thing that we're changing is community involvement. It goes to Marvin and Alex's point. Um, they were involved, but they were involved in the periphery. They were not in our inner circle, so to speak, at our meetings. And by the end of this year, and definitely early next year, we're going to be having community members sitting on all of our internal meetings, our subcommittees, main committees. These are top leaders that are in these, uh, chairing these committees. We're also uh, creating a community advisory council. So they will be an inherent part of all of the reform efforts happening justice system wide. So I think that those were extremely problematic, not doing that from the beginning. Um, and we learned. And some people were there at the beginning, many weren't, and it was a labor of love to bring everybody to the point where we could all agree, all right, we're gonna do this and do it the right way. So I'm interested in how that's gonna look and what that's gonna bring and the new perspectives um, that are gonna be heard. Uh, yeah, just to add, <clears throat> I'll, I'll be the less optimistic voice. Um, I'm very fun at parties. Um, I, I think we're at um, a very dangerous time in the pretrial movement and in what is called the criminal justice reform movement generally. Again, I don't ever use the phrase criminal justice system without air quotes. Um, I think that, that if you look at the, there was a bail reform movement in federal courts in the 1960s. And people were saying all of the same things. It's, it's so wrong to keep people in jail just because they're poor. It doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it has these twin problems that, that you were discussing. You know, it, it's letting some people out of jail without any rigorous analysis and it's keeping other people in jail. And this is, this is what the prominent federal judges and Bobby Kennedy and other people like that were saying, like elites in the American society were saying this in the 60s. That eventually led to bail reform in the federal court system. And so now today, those of you who are familiar with federal courts, we don't really use money bail in federal court. In federal court, there's a system of transparent pretrial release and detention. Prior to the Federal Bail Reform Act of 1984, when we used primarily money bail in federal court, the uh, about 24% of all people charged with federal crimes were detained prior to trial. Most of those people were detained because they couldn't pay, okay? Today, as I sit here, the detention rate in federal courts is 72.4%. It's triple. Three times as many people are being detained in federal court now than they were before bail reform, okay? So, um, similarly, uh, one of the other problems with the money bail system that we haven't talked a lot about today is even the people that are getting out of jail on, in the current money bail system, their families are paying a lot of money to the commercial bail bond industry. This is a billions of dollar a year wealth transfer from the poorest people in our society to that industry. What we're seeing all over the country now is as the use of for-profit bail bonds goes down, we're seeing the rise of for-profit conditions. So in, instead of paying a company for a bail bond, now you pay some of the same like private equity firms and uh, other sort of anonymous owners of all of this stuff, you pay some of the same people $10 a day for an electronic monitor that watches everywhere you go, or $40 a month for a private for-profit supervision fee, or $20 a pop for a drug test. So you've got the same interests making the same amount of money off of the same people with a different label. The reason I make that point is, unless we fundamentally understand why the money bail system was created, I worry that the punishment bureaucracy, as I call it, will reproduce the same mechanisms of oppression using a different name. So instead of money bond, it'll call it pretrial detention. Um, instead of um, money bond for the people that are released, they'll call it like GPS monitoring. Um, and that to me uh, gets to the deeper point, which is um, why do we have such a big criminal punishment bureaucracy? and what interest is it serving, whose interest is it serving, and how do we build power to fight against it? We've got a lot of people now, um, some of them at this conference, um, who are leading figures of what's called the criminal justice reform movement. 
Um, but they're proposing solutions that won't actually dismantle the criminal punishment bureaucracy. They're proposing solutions that will perpetuate much of the architecture of the system while perhaps shaving off some of its most grotesque flourishes. And for me, um, what's gonna be really important in 2020 um, is going around the country to promote my new book, um, which is, I'm just kidding. I did write a book about this, um, and all the proceeds go to SE Justice Group, an amazing organization that is organizing women with incarcerated loved ones. Um, but like, the reason I'm I took a lot of time out of the litigation to like, write about this is that I'm very scared that right now as we speak, we have people trying to convince, and the book is called Usual Cruelty, by the way. Um, that was horrible. You heard um, it here first. Really shameless. Um, but I'm obsessed with this now because um, I very much worry that um, w we will be in a position in a year, in two years, in five years, where we haven't dismantled the criminal punishment bureaucracy at all, and we've just started calling things different names. And I just think that's a fundamentally important point. Fantastic. So, we have now reached the question and answer portion of the program. So, anybody who has questions, please raise your hand. Please, go ahead. Um, so, there was a big case in San Francisco, kind of similar, I think, to the Harris County case. And they're reaching a settlement now, and one of the, one of the things in the settlement is this requirement that everybody, there is no money bail, and um, as a result, people who may could have afforded bail will be now held in jail. Like, Let me add a little piece on top of that because I think it's a really important question. If not cash bail, then what? I'll just start briefly because I was one of the lawyers who brought that case originally. I'm no longer involved in the case. Um, I, I do think that that is a big worry. Um, and that's why I think it's, uh, and one of the things that I, I like to talk about is understanding what kinds of reforms are actually gonna be decarceral and what kinds of reforms aren't. And there's a lot of the stuff that's happening in San Francisco and throughout California, um, led particularly by the Judicial Council of California, which is not an anti-carceral body. Um, remember, these are the same people who managed the money bail system for the last three or four decades, right? Um, the Judicial Council was just given $75 million by the California State Legislature to be the ones to solve all these problems, right? Do you think they're calling people like me? Um, I mean, well, that's a bad example because I have a big case in the California Supreme Court on this question, but um, <laughs> they're not calling people like me. Uh, um, and, and, um, and so I'm very worried about things like what's happening in San Francisco. And San Francisco is probably in the best position of any county in the entire state. Um, it's a really bad situation. I was just talking yesterday and the day before with, with the folks in Santa Clara, and it's a nightmare what's going on in Santa Clara. And that's considered to be the best um, county in the state. Um, so I'm very, very concerned about this. Um, SB 10 is the bill that was just passed in California that eliminates the money bail system in California. One of the things that people didn't talk about with SB 10, which was a, a bill that was supported by SE Justice Group and a lot of the other base building organizations and the ACLU and, and other organizations, um, that bill that they supported was gutted in secret in the la at the last minute by the Judicial Council of California they inserted into it a totally new bill. The totally new bill says anyone can be arrested in California uh, and uh, they're, they're not gonna be given money bail, but they can be detained for up to nine business days, essentially, until a bail hearing. So that could be almost two weeks of pretrial detention. Um, and that will be the law in California. Um, the bail industry is sponsoring a ballot initiative to actually overturn SB 10, which I and many others opposed opposed SB 10. Um, that's just one horrible feature of SB 10. It does other things um, that are really bad. Um, 
and, and I think it's really important to note in California and elsewhere, the critical piece, and this is something Marvin highlighted earlier that I just want to make sure people understand, the thing that was so great about the New York legislation was it shrunk what we call the detention net. It, 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 made it, it, it made the offenses that you can even ask the question, can we give this person money bill or can we detain them, it made that smaller. So it took away discretion from judges and prosecutors to do bad things and left them with the discretion to do good things. And in California, um, that's really the open question. SB 10 attempts to expand California's detention net to increase the number of, of types of offenses by several hundred thousand people a year who are eligible for child detention. And so what we're fighting now in California in our Supreme Court case and, and with the community is trying to shrink that net. And the next wave of bail reform in 2020 and beyond, in my opinion, will be all about whether we can shrink the net because only by constraining the ability of the system to do bad things, I think are we actually going to see decarceral reforms in pretrial. Daniel, please. So I think that you know New Jersey is held up as, as, a, as a standard for bail reform, but I think that that's one of the, the unfortunate things that they've actually seen is an increased number of um, petitions for no bail hearings, and, and you see a lot of them getting dropped after a person spends a few days in jail. And so, like, like was said, I think really limiting the number of offenses or the types of offenses that are eligible for a no bail hearing is, is really important. First, head of the back there, and hot Jasmine. I'll give kind of a nerdy answer. So I think that uh, if you look at the Constitution, right, if you look at the, the Eighth Amendment and the, the original intent of it, it's really a limit on judges' discretion. It is, it is saying that, that judges can only set uh, fines and fees or bail or punishment within the limits that the legislature has prescribed. So it is the duty of the legislature to limit judicial discretion on the high end, not on the low end, you know, I'm categorically opposed to mandatory minimum sentences, but on the high end, I think it is the duty of the legislature to limit the, uh, the discretion of judges. I mean, even the most heinous crimes, a judge can't sentence somebody to be, you know, hung in the middle of the town square. It, they just can't do that because we limit judicial discretion, and it's important that legislatures do so. And then, um and in New York State, addressing New York State, um, in contrast to SB 10, uh, we were very aware of what was going on in, in California with SB 10 when we were uh, drafting the bill for uh, the legislation in New York State to not get caught up in, in the same system that, that, that uh, SB 10 got caught up in. And uh, as far as uh, judicial uh, discretion, we have limited that um, in New York State. And uh, also we were acutely aware of um, of uh, risk assessments and electronic monitoring, which is which has been called the uh, incarceration. So um, those are the things that we have to take into uh, consideration as well. And any other states that were uh, uh, overhauling their pre pretrial justice systems uh, need to take into account and be aware of as well. Thank you, sir. in criminal justice where you might see a decrease in mass incarceration, but um, a stagnance or maybe even increase in racial disparities. Um, so I wanted to ask um, an open question whether there's been anything done legislatively or you know, instructionally or something along the lines of that that has um, focused specifically on reducing racial disparities in um, uh, pre-trial release. Michael, I want to go to you first. Sure. <laughs> So, 
going to step lightly on this. There's some pending litigation that the ACLU filed against our municipal court focused on arraignments. So I'll, I'll step carefully. But what I will say is what we're doing is it's a, it's a huge challenge. And we're working with our partners through the Safety and Justice Challenge to start injecting um, the best that we can, the best that we know how, um, uh, people with that knowledge. So the mayor's office has hired a racial and ethnic disparity coordinator who's now sitting on all of our committees and injecting um, a better perspective on, okay, you're talking about this, how can we focus on um, these disparities in these initiatives? So there's a lot of that discussion. There's a lot of internal, and as, as what I hope is effective, um, racial and ethnic disparity uh, training across every person that's involved in the justice system in Philadelphia. Um, you know, there's science out there that says, yeah, it works at first and then it doesn't. But um, I, I won't lie, it is a major challenge that we're facing. And we've worked with the Burns Institute is, is one of our technical assistance partners. Um, and they're working with us. We're creating a RRI, which uh, racial uh, index at all of the decision points throughout the system to try and identify um, where those are happening and allow us and point us in the direction to take a deeper dive into why. And our goal is once we really have those numbers to if we have to go to a case level uh, look at what's happening at charging or at sentencing or um, uh, at the point of arrest, then that's what our goal is to do, is to break that down and really start looking at it closer. Um, so I think it's a challenge nationwide and it's one that we are trying to dive into head first um, and you know, we'll see where it goes and hopefully we, we can break through and find what it is um, to fix this. I just want to say one thing to that. I think it's a big mistake to think about bail reform and even criminal justice reform in a silo. And if you confine your attention to just criminal justice reform, you're never going to solve the racial disparity question because the whole criminal punishment system is designed to be a tool of racial control. So you're always, if, as long as you work within that system, I think you're gonna be vexed because you're gonna be saying, everything I'm doing, it's leading to this result, but th that's because the criminal punishment system's whole point over, over centuries has been to do that. So wh what I've tried to do a little bit of, of thinking and writing about recently is, like, how do we identify the kinds of interventions that are actually gonna address that? And to me, one of them is, it has to go beyond the criminal punishment system. It has to address things like structural inequality um, and what our neighborhoods and communities look like and healthcare and things like that. And, then it, and, then it, and it can't be what I call only forward looking. It has to also be backward looking. What I mean by that is, is things like reparations. Like, if, if you want to address some of the, the fundamental, like, um, racial inequities that are manifesting at every corner of the criminal punishment system, you've got to start taking some intentional steps to remedy some of the reasons for those disparities. And to me, to me, it's, it's a, and, and there's some great work being done around the country by people in communities about, um, you know, um, funding worker-owned co-ops that are led by formerly incarcerated people, by um, reserving licenses for marijuana businesses for people who are directly impacted. Um, there's many, many examples of things that I think of as our backward looking that are actually building economic power and wealth in those communities. When you build economic power and wealth in those communities, you take economic power and wealth away from the, com from the elites that have been exploiting those communities, then I think you'll start to see racial disparities go down. But I don't think you can do it just through bail reform. I saw on other hands. Jasmine.
So I can, I can talk about the money aspect um, because that's another area where we're getting pushback. Uh, they point to New Jersey and say, you know, look how much money they're spending. Ohio can't afford that. Um, and that's where, I, where my argument is, you know, every jurisdiction needs to abide by certain principles that, that we allow people to enjoy the presumption of innocence, that they enjoy their, their pretrial liberty. Um, but the minutia should be, should be highly individualized to the local jurisdiction. We have really tiny counties where they're not going to have 24-7 pretrial services available. And that's okay because the presumption should be that people are just let go anyway, right? I mean, that's, that's what we should be doing. That should be the normal uh, matter of fact for us. Um, we have one county, Summit County, uh, where Akron, Ohio is, and they invested in some, some pretrial reforms. They've estimated that in one year they saved $7 million because they work with a nonprofit that, that helps them to, um, I don't want to, I don't want to say uh, e-carcerate, but, but you know, keep track and provide services for, for people. Um, and it costs them one to five dollars a day, it, um, picked up by the, by the county um, in, in exchange for saving about $130 a day that they're, they were spending for incarcerating people pre-trial. Um, thanks. Um, I, I hate to take the mic from this guy. I love what he's saying. But. <laughs> I really do. So, but um, uh, just just an example. I th I think I alluded to. It, I spoke about it earlier. Uh, at the height of Rikers Island's uh, population, there were twenty two thousand uh, men and women being incarcerated. Uh, fast forward to twenty nineteen, uh, we're at like seventy five hundred. And at the height of uh, the uh, population of Rikers Island, there were f like fourteen thousand. Um, um, Department of Corrections, New York City Department of Corrections employees. Fast forward, we have 7,500 uh, people incarcerated. We still have 14,000 uh, employees um, monitoring the care, custody, and control of this population. So um, at this point in time, there's no justification uh, to uh, continue with that type of uh, uh, expenditure. So, I mean, with, when um, the new legislation comes into effect January 1st, it will, it will, it will become clearly evident that uh, money will be saved as a result of decarceration. I want to give it back to him. <laughs> yes, please, in the back. So I can touch a bit on what Philadelphia has done and is doing um, as far as electronic monitoring is concerned. So as our prison population has declined, our electronic monitoring population has also declined. And that is, I along with others have made a concerted effort to not inject EM into the initiatives that we're working on. So it, it's a challenge and um, if, you, if you don't in addition, if you don't have those resources sitting on a shelf waiting to be used, that's helpful too. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm seeing what's going on around the country, and it is, let's put more people on bracelets. Um, but it can be done differently. You just have to be extraordinarily intentional, and the people who are on the ground making the decisions really need to make sure that they are thoughtful of that. I think, I mean, the importance of it is, is just clear. It goes to, we're changing it from jail cells to their homes. Isn't that, the home becomes the jail cell, right? So as we're, we were focusing, and I wouldn't say that I was necessarily intentionally in meetings saying we're not gonna do EM. I just didn't, we didn't bring it up. So I oversee all of the EM for adult, adults within um, Philadelphia. And it, it, it would come up on occasion, like, oh, maybe for domestic violence we could get GPS. And I'm like, GPS is really, really, really expensive, and we would have to do it, and we don't have the money, let's move on. And 
you didn't really, I didn't really get a whole lot of blowback for that. And um, we haven't seen any major issues. I'm hoping to keep GPS way away. I'm hoping to keep our EM usage down where it is now as we continue through this. But it's doable, and unfortunately, in other places, they're seeing that, that that's their crutch. Like, okay, we feel, we feel better now, because they have a bracelet on. So I think it's just a mentality, and it uh, goes back to implementation. How are you doing these things? There's a question in the back. Yeah, absolutely. In Philadelphia, they nobody pays when they have a bracelet on. So there was a ancillary cost, if you will, a couple years ago, where that you had to have a landline phone in your house. So whatever the cost was for that per month, um, I thought it was absurd. We looked at new equipment that could be wireless, so those who did have to go on to EM would have no cost other than they needed to have a residence. You know, I could talk all day about the problems with that, like the. Now, now we're keeping people in jail because they don't have a house and we're keeping people in jail because they're homeless or they have nowhere to go or the landlord says no and all of those things compile. But um, it, there were side discussions here and there about should we start doing it and I was very firm in we're not doing it. We haven't done it, the conversation hasn't come back up and I'm, I'm confident it won't because it's embedded in our resources right now. So. I have time for one more question. Uh, I think, sir, you in the back, you had your hand up before. I know that was an issue in New York, which is why I was looking at you. Um, the, uh, the concern, basically, as, as I understand it, is when you decrease the detention net of eligible offenses, do you incentivize prosecutors and police to charge people with things that are, are higher? I think you guys confronted that in the... I don't want to put you on the spot. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'll try to answer the best as, as I can. Um, yeah, when... when um, we have uh, certain categories, like you said, that are ineligible for bail, and others, others such as uh, um, statutory, statutory um, uh, um, felonies, such as um, burglary in the second degree and robbery in the second degree, which are technically violent, but where there is no violence occurred. Those um, categories of, of um, offenses are also covered under the um, no, no, no cash bail law at this point in time. But when you get a situation where the district attorneys or the prosecutors want to upcharge or overcharge just for the, for the sake of keeping a person um, incarcerated um, or for whatever the case to strengthen their case, um, these are things that uh, we are currently, currently um, uh, discussing with district attorneys. I just left the uh, Brooklyn district attorney right before I left here. And, and we had a, 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 an in-depth conversation about just those type of things where um, prosecutors are saying that they're going to, um, for uh, lack of another term, do some shady stuff, right? Some pretty shady stuff just to keep people uh, um, incarcerated, such as uh, putting a a protective order on all cases so that they don't uh, fall under the guidelines of, of the 15-day discovery limit, things like that. So um, uh, I don't know if this satisfies your question or not, but I want to let you know that that is uh, something that we are definitely uh, concerned with and uh, will be monitoring during implementation.
Marvin, you had the last word. Please give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you all. <laughs>